All right, we are at the top of the hour. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today. It's wonderful to have such a large audience for this webinar focused on putting green education. It's definitely that time of year, right, JW? The weather's warming up. Uh, the master's just wrapped up as well, so life is good. Um, I believe we have five different countries represented on today's call, so welcome to everyone joining us wow. here, in, uh, here in the States and around the world, so that's awesome. Thanks, thanks for being here. We've got plenty to talk about, so we won't waste any time getting started with what you need to know before installing your next putting green. My name is Brad Borgman. Uh, we'll do a quick, uh, quick intro slide. Um, I'm the director of sales with US Green Tech. I've spent about 12 years in the industry um, working both on the supplier manufacturer side with, uh, with US Green Tech, of course. I spent, I guess, about the first six years or so of my uh, time in the industry working with installation groups in California. So that's where I um, was really intimate with putting greens, among other applications. Um, I've got a landscape design background, so that also helps me understand both the conceptual and, and construction needs of these types of applications. With me today is Joe Watkins, also known as JW. Say hello, everyone. Hello, there's everybody. a great Glad deal of technical language and considerations uh, with these applications, and there's no one better than JW to help us understand those. So beyond being a great friend of, me, of mine personally, JW is an author, he's an inventor, and just overall global synthetic turf expert. So we feel fortunate to have us with us today. You're too kind. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. I'm glad to be here. I really am. So here's our lineup today. Um, we're going to have a little fun. Um, again, it's a lot of information, but I can guarantee you, you will learn at least one to two important things today, right, JW? Yeah, if, you're, if you don't already know, I know there's a lot of uh, installers on here that are just amazing installers of putting greens, and I'm so glad that, you know, the experts uh, did come on the call um, uh, as well, um, other than even beginners, and I really appreciate uh, those top dogs being on here. Thank you. Yeah, well said. Um, we also want to reserve as much time as possible, of course, for um, an interactive Q&A session towards the end. So in totality, we'll have about an hour today. Um, so we'll get to as many of those Real questions quick. as possible. Please drop those in the Q&A box. Um, I believe the chat functionality is disabled. So use the Q&A box for those questions. Uh, speaking of interactive, JW and I will present the information uh, in a fairly casual manner. Again, we're here to have fun. We're here to learn. Um, we're going to do kind of a Q&A style amongst ourselves as well. Uh, but JW will really be filling in most of the gaps relative to each, each topic. So um, JW, if you're ready to rock and roll, we'll get started. Hey, ask away. So, you know, obviously there's, um, there's a lot of uh, layers, no pun intended, to putting green installations, and we're going to get through most of those. Uh, you know, we could probably talk for three days about this topic, but there's only so much time. So um, we are going to stop kind of or start kind of from the top and really talk about design, layout, and estimating how all those things kind of interplay with one another. Um, obviously, um, putting greens can be a little bit more intricate, complex than your average, uh, say, residential lawn installation. Um, so first off, JW, why is it important to understand the, the skill level of your client early on in the process? And how does it um, you know, interplay with this slide here? Well, what happens is whenever you go to uh, actually do an estimate for a synthetic turf putting green, um, you have to ask uh, the client whether they're a beginner, avid, or pro, because that's going to dictate whether you're able to actually put that putting green in for them. Um, because the, the main purpose is these two things, the ball and the putter, and the practice for that person uh, that wants that green. Um, when I ask turf installers what their handicap in golf is, they look at me like I have a third eye. I mean, that doesn't mean you have to give your whole entire frontline golf lessons, but they need to have an understanding of what they're constructing. And uh, if you do not understand golf or putting greens and your client is an avid golfer, you may receive a lot of callbacks due to a poorly constructed green. Yeah, and so this notion here towards the bottom of the slide of pro, avid, or beginner, can you speak to that? Well, if you've never done putting greens before and, and you go in to estimate a, a professional putting green for a golfer that's a pro, I would actually run or, or pass on the job. Um, but if it's a putting greens and, and you want to learn on them, it's just a small 
uh, for beauty looks for little Johnny to uh, putt putt outside. Um, you know, the problem is, is, you know, it's, it's made for a purpose and that's for practice and play. And if it doesn't play right, then, um, the, you've got to be removed or it's, you're going to be getting a lot of callbacks. Yeah. So right at the top, you know, a lot of, a lot of different consideration of course, beauty versus performance, another one, right. You know, we've got a, sure. an image of a step meter, different styles of, of artificial grass being used, Mm -hmm. for putting greens. Um, can you explain the differences, you know, in the most common types of putting green products used? Well, the most common types used today are either texturized nylon, PP, polypropylene, and uh, then there's the all infill slit film, uh, which is mostly uh, made up of polypropylene. Um, even though a texturized nylon PP, a nylon and a PP can produce good step meter speeds uh, up to 12, uh, in fact, uh, a slip film PP can provide more realistic play of the ball, including holding shots like up to 55 plus yards away. And both have their own, uh, you know, installation considerations too, right? So like kind of going back to that first slide, really understanding your clientele is, is a great place to start. Can't go wrong with that. True. You know, just a quick um, quick mention of waste. Obviously, waste is involved in any project out there, right? Um, but just being um, or understand why waste may be more critical, you know, on a putting green um, than, you know, a, a big rectangle. Do you want to talk to that, JW? Well, there's, there's not a lot of waste, uh, per se, on the actual putting green surface, except, you know, the radius is get cut off on the outside. Um, you do have a uh, certain radius waste, but uh, majority of the uh, waste comes with exterior fringe. And um, so if you're going to have uh, an exterior fringe around the whole putting green, I would definitely um, not use all the scraps from your jobs left over from the back and create all these seams. I would actually um, explain to the client that you're going to have to probably buy a whole run um, of a, a roll past the putting green just so you can cut down the middle to do uh, fringe on each side and up to three foot. So uh, waste, somebody has to pay for it. So I would sit down with the client and, and let them know that. Yeah. Yeah. Key takeaway there, right. And somebody has to pay for it. And, you know, there's, um, the industry is becoming more sophisticated. There, there could be, um, other tools out there that will help you estimate these projects and, and keep your waste at a minimum. Um, so yeah, if you don't use something like that, you know, maybe, maybe, um, do some research and see if there's something out there. Well, you also do. don't want to push waste, uh, versus performance, meaning, you know, if you're going to be putting a friend on an exterior, uh, putting green three to six feet and you're using a bunch of scraps, um, you're going to have a lot of seams, which, if that golfer is using that uh, to practice a lot, you're gonna be having a lot of parted hair where, where there's a lot of traffic and where he wants to chip. So uh, I would just recommend uh, the less seams around the fringe as possible. Yeah. Well, as we move through kind of, uh, again, the layers of the, of the project of the, uh, you know, the turf profile, we're obviously um, here looking at various photos. Um, a lot of them are, are ag aggregates and base materials. We've got an image in the upper left-hand corner of standing water, which you know is never a good sign when you're walking onto a project site. Um, but JW, since um, maybe focusing on the aggregate side of this slide, since aggregates and subgrade conditions can really vary in different regions of the country and, and based on today's audience around the world maybe, what should an installer look for to make sure they're choosing the proper materials to build a great subbase? Well, that picture up to the left, uh, uh, that's pretty scary. Um, that looks like they have a definitely uh, water issue um, and drainage issue. But uh, depending on the existing conditions, uh, I recommend using material that is free of conglomerates. Um, dirty and contaminated materials, uh, they reach low compaction numbers. And I recommend placing materials that could reach 95% compaction if needed. Um, and uh, the reason why dirty and contaminated, uh, contaminated materials are not good because what happens is they'll absor absorb exterior moisture coming up if you have an elevated putting rate. So focusing really on that, that free draining material, um, trying to get away get from- permeable and uh, be able to uh, compact and hold a, hold a compaction uh, for 
Right. Even if they have, you know, most putting greens uh, out there don't have any type, uh, drainage holes in them. A majority of them don't. So the exterior water is coming from the outside. And so the first part of the, the failure is the exterior fringe or anything coming to it if they uh, have any type of exterior water coming through there. So it's good to have a good dense material so that, that will prevent that from actually leaching and coming through and, and causing irregular ball play. Well said. Um, so, you know, another uh, subgrade consideration, um, and again, another topic, you know, that we could talk a lot about, um, you know, environmental considerations, again, can be a little bit different based on where you're at in the, in the country or the where the world, but maybe one um, item on here that stands out. Um, well, I know you recently had a, a run in with a gopher. So tell us a little bit about that and how they can impact your putting green. Well, I'm looking at this slide here and, you know, I've witnessed installers ignore all the contents in this slide, Brad. Um, uh, the, the gopher problem, San Diego, I got a call, uh, the contractor wasn't getting paid. He didn't understand why the turf was getting all these bumps and wrinkles in it when he had compacted and even had pictures to prove it. Well, it was actually a gopher trying to get out. And when he pulled it up, it was, I mean, it was, it was destroyed. The little guy was probably spent days trying to get out from underneath there. So the whole putting green had to be uh, reinstalled uh, and even new turf had to be purchased. Um, so, you know, if you are in a region with gophers, I would definitely put gopher screen down below your, your putting green so no varmints will be coming up through it. Um, but, you know, I have a saying that I tell installers when they first get into the biz and, and it's, there's never enough time to do the job right, but always enough time to do it over. Don't be one of those guys. And this is really important because everything on this slide, you know, you must do your due diligence when it comes to all types of things coming from below and from the side. As you see here, there's a putting green with tree roots. Well, apparently they didn't understand about they should have dug down on the putting green and put a bio barrier, which protects any type of tree roots coming into the putting green. And uh, so, you know, do your due diligence uh, before you bid a putting green and see what's out there and, and even ask the homeowners because mushrooms, you know, if you have mushrooms under your putting green and you don't have any type of uh, pre-emergent to anything to stop it, they're strong enough to create bumps and, and they will lift the putting green up and uh, it'll be destroyed. So it's uh, really, really imperative that uh, yeah. you do due diligence on what's underneath before you put over. Yeah, and I know um, maybe there's there's some folks on the line that you are just getting started out and maybe they haven't done a ton of putting greens, but... Um, you know, that surface has to be meticulous, right? So even, you know, maybe a beginner golfer um, uh, will notice that, right? If, if that sub base is not prepared uh, properly and, and, and very tight. So, you know, on this slide, um, kind of orient me here. We're looking at a uh, sub base, some compactors. And then in the middle here, we got a big picture of, a, I think, a skate park. So what is going on here? Well, yeah, you're, you're so right on that um, because the golfers will complain uh, if the putting green is not rolling right. And a majority of the reason why they're not rolling is number one, infill placement. And number two, the subgrade is not compacted properly or they don't understand. Uh, sometimes it's hard for an installer to understand how tight and smooth the putting green's base should be. And so de decades ago, uh, I took my crews to an outdoor skateboard, uh, concrete skate park, and uh, they thought I was insane. But after asking them to examine the undulations and how smooth they were, uh, our grading and compaction became so much better. Yeah, and, you know, the, the idea of actually experiencing a real golf course, right? How invaluable is that um, to walk through... Um, whether it's a, even a practice green, um, or walk down a fairway and look at the surfaces from different angles, uh, it can really help take that um, that installation to a new level if you really kind of understand the motion of that's, the That's very true, Brad. And, and what I did in the past, and I, I tell installers today, um, you know, if, if your front line is not really familiar with, you know, the beauty of, of putting greens and, and the exterior lines and what they look like, uh, you could always go to a swap meet or, or, or Amazon and order some Augusta or golf uh, putting green um, uh, calendars. And uh, you can see pictures of all types of uh, professional putting greens, which will give them a better idea of, of the contourness and, and, and what, you know, what they have to look for. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, another um, very important component um, and, you know, different methodologies used too for cup installation, right? Different, different types oh, yeah. of materials, different methodologies. But um, can you share some maybe tried and true techniques or methods around cup installation that oh, kind of just... achieve or focus on the durability and longevity aspect of, of the cups? Well, I'm sure there are many on this call today that have their own techniques and cup placement. Um, I, I know so many that have sent me pictures of sleeves and different type of, of uh, gadgets, how they put together and, and uh, whether it be WD-40 spraying, wax paper sleeves, you know, as long as I recommend not putting them in compacted dirt, you know, you get a big rainfall, it's going to loosen up. And not only that, if you see the picture up there where I call it the putting green cup volcano, uh, you'll see where the cup, what it, uh, when it goes in and out, exactly, when it goes in and out of the, uh, the cup so much, you know, they take a beating. And, um, and especially when they put them in and they drag to the left or right, it'll create that dirt to move and create that, that volcano um, in a sense. And so I, I would say as long as your cup is stable, it will not settle or nor tilt. Um, because like they do, they, they take a beating and, uh, and even well-constructed sleeves can be adjusted to the putting green surface too, after, you know, period of time of matting, but it's so crucial, uh, for you to secure, uh, putting green cups. Um, uh, uh, and I, however you want to do them, as long as they don't move, settle or tilt and, uh, and last, you know, the life of the putting green. Yeah. You know, one um, request that uh, we used to get again, you know, when I worked on the installation side is, hey, what if I want to move this cup placement um, a couple of years from now? I kind of get bored with the way it is. Um, how have you, have you handled that yourself? Well, it could happen, but it's very labor intensive, um, very labor intensive. And, and it, they hardly ever come out perfect because you definitely, if you want to move, you, you're just going to either have to flip it up and move a hole and re, redo the because you got to understand you, you're going to want a, a cylinder around that, that cup. So in, in case you do do the WD-40 method or the wax paper, you're able to take the cup in and out. Um, yes, after you get silica sand, in, it'll be tough to get out, uh, but you can adjust them. Um, but for a cup, move, moving a cup and, and, and replacing it, I wouldn't recommend it on a synthetic turf putting green. You just open up a can of worms. Uh, you'd always plug them with a cup, you know, cup uh, um, caps. Uh, but moving it, uh, they can be done, uh, but it's, 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 I, I wouldn't recognize it. But the reason why also you want your cups to be concreted as well is, you know, when you go back to do your money shot uh, and your cups and your flag, I mean, your flags are actually tilted and your cups are not level. Make sure when you put your cups in, you're always using a torpedo to get them level um, so that your flags will all be uh, uh, vertical with your, for your money shots. Good tip. Good tip. <clears throat> Um, so the next couple of slides, we'll, we'll kind of switch gears just a little bit, but, um, when we get into, you know, the construction of the base and we're just about ready for the turf layout, mm -hmm. um, some different techniques, um, or, you know, in this case, radius points and how radius points can really improve the finished product. So we'll, I'll maybe flip back and forth here, but, um, we're looking at, you know, the start and completion of this phase of the project. What are the benefits of radius points, JW, or maybe even just a simple definition and well, how do we you actually about, create them on the sub base? Yeah. Well, we talked about that calendar, you know, cause you look at, you know, most putting greens around golf courses, most of them, they're, they're everything smooth and they match up with that smoothness. And most of the smoothness comes from smooth radius. Uh, a radius is the distance from a circle center. And, um, and I recommend, you know, pulling exterior radius points from the center of cups to start with, you know, that, that actually will exactly right there. It'll give you, uh, it'll give you the actual circles that you need to go to the exterior line to get that perimeter. Um, they might not be that big that you want, but, you know, I always say start farther outside and then you could always work your way in. But, uh, you know, pulling radius points uh, off of putting greens and, uh, and connecting them together um, really beautifies the putting green. Yeah, which we can see here, obviously, with some, some finished product images and how just uh, you know, clean and, and consistent the transition is from, from one cup area to the next. Um, you know, we're looking at some sidewalk chalk. We're looking at a, a blue device here. Do you want to just mention, you know, how you use those, what those are? Well, the sidewalk chalk is actually an easy 
uh, a marking tool that'll power broom off or wash off later. I mean, it'll probably walk off. For marking your radius points, um, after you mark them and, and find out, you know, once you have your design or schematic of how the putting green is going to be, you'll go ahead and, you know, create your radius on the, uh, on the soil like you've seen prior. And then once you get the putting green laid out, you're going to have your established radius point dimensions that you're going to keep. And then you're going to transfer them up above uh, to, the, uh, to the turf. And so we always like cutting uh, the backing on synthetic turf instead of the top fibers. So the, the, uh, right there, the tool is called a push cutter. Uh, what it does, it cuts from the bottom. And so what you do is you go to the center of the cup, like you did below on the, on the compacting and subgrading layout on the radiuses. And you go above and you take the uh, sidewalk chalk and you mark out your radiuses just like you did below. And the push cutter will actually uh, connect and cut the turf uh, very uh, uh, fast and smooth fashion instead of cutting on the top fibers. A majority of, of turf contractors uh, carry these and some may have their own way of, of cutting and creating these, but this is a, a way that I recommend. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you mentioned, you know, the skill set um, of some folks that we have on this call and, and some of those um, installers are extremely efficient and proficient um, with doing it by hand. But yeah, I mean, if you've never used a push cutter before, um, you know, especially for those that may be just getting started out, uh, it, it's, a, it's a very useful tool. It's a great yeah. tool. I, I feel that push cutter is, is probably one of the best tools in your toolbox. Yeah. Other than my, other than my phone number. <laughs> Which we'll give you later, I think. So hang on for that. Um, all right, so turf placement and seam. So seaming, obviously a very critical uh, part of any installation, whether you're dealing with uh, gosh, even a sports field or um, just a, a, a landscape lawn, a playground, what have you, um, can be time consuming. Uh, it's critical, but we talked about how meticulous that surface needs to be on a putting green, whether you're using uh, a sand filled or a slip fill material, a sand filled type of system or, or texturized. So um, JW, what are some best practices around seaming techniques on a putting green? And, you know, are they different than any other, any other project? Well, they are because uh, landscape turf, uh, you have a, a higher, uh, a taller pile height to hide your mistakes or any type of uh, um, gaps uh, that may come due to any type of thing, you know, uh, thermal contraction expansion. Uh, but you could ruin a, a putting green in its entire installation by, by your front line not being educated on unifying two sections of putting green turf together. And, and what I mean by that, unifying means as one. So you're creating that surface to be as one um, I do not recommend using embeds, nails, staples, other than uh, semi tape and a really good adhesive that can withstand thermal expansion and contraction. Because you got to understand when we talk a little later about placing the infill, we're, we're actually, you know, placing uh, three pounds of, of infill in there that is going to actually have heat transfer. And that's going to actually want uh, the seams to have stress and have possible seam rupture. So it's really crucial for you to have a good seaming, um, not only a good seaming frontline team that understands it, but uh, the, the materials itself um, is crucial. And, you know, you see a picture up there to the left where they're putting small nails next to each other very close. It was very, very hot that day. And they were trying to get the seam done and, and things were just moving, this turf was moving. And so this is that actual, you know, for you cannot go away and think that that seam's not going to move while you're doing the rest of the fringe or, or even come back tomorrow. Um, it's going to want to move on you. So you want to make sure that it's secured while the adhesive is, is totally cured. Um, otherwise, you come back and you want to put the infill early in the morning, you're going to see possible uh, a small seam rupture that you might not be able to see by a naked eye. But when you get to the infill process at the end and you're starting to, uh, you know, fibrillate with the power broom, um, it's going to start parting where that sand is going to be pushing it open because it, it's actually uh, went past its um, manufactured gauge, gauge width that you should have respected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and speaking of infill, we're going to transition into that in just a second. Um, you know, we, again, there's five different countries represented. Um, there's different uh, climates represented here, some in, you know, cold weather climates consistently throughout the year. So, you know, I'm just looking at this, um, this last image, you know, if, if, 
if there are, I, I would just encourage everyone that there's so many different techniques out there that can help make your project go smoother. And, you know, this is just one of them relative to, you know, keeping a, a seam at the proper temperature and adhesive at the proper temp temperature. But, you know, reach out to your memory, see what techniques are, are being used outside of your walls. I think it'll go a long way. Well, that, the, you know, the picture where you see the, the, the heater, you know, if you're going to be doing putting greens and, and a, a lot of companies um, that I speak with that, you know, they're working when it's snowing, they're trying to get projects done because, you know, there's, there's buildings being developed, commercial uh, projects that are still on the, on the run, even if it's got snow on the ground, they're still wanting them to be placed. And it's really important if you're going to be tuning, taking any type of texturized uh, putting green, you'll definitely want to keep the surface warm uh, so it'll contour to your grade and your undulations. Um, and also it does assist with the, um, the actual seaming because it makes the turf a little bit more flexible so that you can kick together if you have any type of undulations that are having any type of gaps. So if you're in the areas that do have a, a freezing temp and you're wanting to put in, you know, stiff putting cream, you, you, get, you gotta get it flexible for it to, to uh, uh, contour, uh, especially for the large undulations. Yeah. It may take some patience, right, on top of that. But yeah, let's talk a little bit about um, about infill. So infill is, you know, kind of um, uh, synonyms in, in this case. Um, obviously, US Green Tech, we produce infills. This is not a sales webinar, but, um, you know, what type of infill should I use? What size do I use? How much infill do I use? Questions that we get all the time, um, you know, on a daily basis. Um, so, you know, we manufacture two primary infill uh, sizes uh, of Envirofill, a 1630 mesh or sieve size and a 3050. So really, again, depending on the type of putting green material you're using, um, slip film versus texturized, um, there'll be a little, uh, each one of these will be appropriate for, for those two styles of putting greens. Um, they both have microban incorporated into it. So that's an antibacterial. It's gonna fight against mold and mildew as well, which we all know can be uh, very susceptible on putting greens due to the drainage qualities. Um, it's highly round, so it's gonna improve the drainage and, and the consistency of the performance of the ball versus having kind of an inconsistent angular material uh, mixed in there, causing ball skips and so on. But um, JW, talk to us about the basic importance of infill and putting greens, whether you use Envirofill, raw sand, or, or something else. Um, there's a lot of different options out there. Well, um, it, ballast, ballast, ballast. Um, if people are on this call and they don't know that word, you must write it down because that is definitely what putting greens need for longevity. Um, not only just for movement, um, but for the longevity of the putting green for UV uh, degradation. Um, but many don't uh, understand that the ball actually plays on the sand level, um, not the fibers. I know it rolls on the fibers, but we're going to get to that. And, um, and I feel that you will never maintain a smooth surface and a true stint meter speed without proper infilling, which we'll talk about here soon. Yeah, and as, as we move on, I feel like I got to mention, you know, there's there's probably a lot of folks on the call that um, have used Envirofill, continue to use Envirofill. We're all seeing tremendous growth in the industry right now, again, on, on top of, you know, many record-breaking years for, for many of you last year. So um, there's, uh, we're producing more product than we ever have, um, but, you know, there's a little bit of a wait time for Envirofill right now, so we appreciate everybody's patience. Uh, but let's um, talk about that wrinkling component here. Uh, JW, um, we're seeing a lot of images um, with apparent wrinkling. Can you give us a, a more maybe technical explanation of how and why this is occurring? Um, and what does infill have to do with it? Ballast, ballast, ballast. Um, ballast allows the turf, uh, it puts weight on it so it doesn't want to move. Um, we all know that all synthetic turf moves when heat is introduced. Uh, especially synthetic turf. I'm sure people out there that have pre, um, experienced wrinkles in turf. Well, when putting greens uh, experience like an excessive heat, they pull from the middle, which will cause wrinkles. And depending on the adhesive, it could be causing seam rupture as well. Like what's going on here. Yeah, and then um, similarly, or, or maybe another consideration here as it relates to 
<clears throat> to, to infill or the performance of infill, right? Um, mm -hmm. It looks like we're looking at a close-up image here of, of a person's heel and then maybe some depression circled. So what's going on in, the, in these images? Well, the, Brad, that's a good example of texturized putting green lacking infill. So the lack of infill will create the irregular ball roll and that will definitely um, affect the stent meter. So what it is is, you know, when we talk about placing the infill here soon, you know, I always recommend burying the, the putting green, not just burying it, you got to put it in a, a certain way, which we'll talk about here soon. But what happens is say if you have, say Gronkowski, say a big football player, 400 pounds, he's, he's, he's standing on his cell phone for like 15 minutes talking to somebody, that weight's gonna push into the, uh, the surface. So if you stay there with that weight and you don't have no ballast, no, no sand, no I mean, not sand, infill that's below the fibers to hold that weight, then the fibers are going to go ahead and press down. They'll actually start creating memory loss and then you'll start having, you know, bouncing in the ball um, due to um, areas that um, have this. I mean, I've seen putting greens where there'll be a lack of infill placed in the putting green and I'll get a, a, a phone call and they'll send me pictures and I'll see this little path. And then I'll ask the golfer, you know, how do you putt? And he's, he has a certain way he wants to putt. Well, everywhere he's walking is depressing the putting green. Now his ball goes in that track because the installer didn't put the infill in properly. Yeah, so in that case, we're asking the turf material to do an awful lot, right? Probably way too much because, you know, that sand is providing, um, providing the performance, providing the support. Um, not only, or not just the, the performance and the consistency of the ball roll. Well, even real courses, you know, the bent grass on real courses, mm -hmm. they're sanded. The sand plays a very important role. Yeah. So you touched um, just a, a moment ago on infill placement. Um, so looking again at a couple of different images here, we got an interesting diagram there in the center. Um, tell me about um, the placement of infill. I mean, isn't it just like any other installation? Uh, what are some of those considerations here? Well, first you need to place it with a proper uh, device, which is a drop shredder. Um, I don't like the whirly bird because they'll have quick uh, buildups. Uh, putting it in by hand, um, I don't recommend. Uh, having a good drop shredder so that you could actually place the infill uh, in a pattern. And here's a pattern here, like alarm clock, you know, going from 12 to six, three to nine, you know, having to put your infill in these, uh, this direction will, will give you a better chance for the infill, infill to be put in equally and, and, and uh, uh, almost to a level point um, ready for cutting. Yeah, so one, uh, one quick thing before getting to cutting actually, um, static electricity. I mean, we see this on all different types of uh, artificial turf installations, right? Playgrounds, another area where a lot of friction is created. Um, you know, by the user group. But, um, you know, when you notice static electricity buildup during an installation, what should an installer do? I mean, how can an installer mm -hmm. manage around the situation to make sure that the installation is going to be done properly? Well, static electricity and synthetic turf is confusing alone um, because a lot of the front line really don't even acknowledge it, that it's even happening. Um, what I start with is when they have static electricity, what that does, it causes them to put less infill in the product because it's hanging up top. And a majority of the people that I have spoken with that are confused about uh, why their, their putting green that they did in the winter time is wrinkling in the summer. Well, what happened was they ended up seeing static electricity and they brought 60 bags out of 80 back to the office thinking they're gonna save their boss money and then when the heat came, it started wrinkling because there was not enough ballast. So respect your turf product specifications on how much is needed. And if it says three pounds, put it all in and, and don't bring anything back to the yard. Um, addressing static electricity, um, I would probably, if you're experiencing it, and you know what, I would probably slowly bury uh, the textured PE or nylon um, and work it in slowly because uh, or, you know, there's a downy trick method, which a lot of people don't know. We'll have to explain that later when you call me, but um, you're going to have it. It's going to happen. So a lot of times if I experience it, uh, I would just go ahead and start burying the putting green and working it in with a, a stiff asphalt broom. 
um, because it's got to be done. And uh, putting water on, it's not going to work as well. And waiting for a rainfall or anything, it's not going to, it's not going to eventually it'll go away, but um, you have to get that infill in a uh, complete system done before you leave the project for after it's, you know, before you roll it. Yeah. And in speaking of water, moisture, um, a lot of considerations there. Um, you know, what's the, maybe what's the takeaway from, from this slide? Can we install um, infill in, in the rain? Why can't we? No, it's just like uh, the picture there with a, uh, the foot in the, the beach sand, you know, when your foot's wet, the sand sticks to it. So that's going to, that's going to trap the fibers. And, you know, I would say don't sabotage your installation by trying to beat the rain or, 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 or respect the days that, you know, rain was, prior and you have, you know, leftover humidity um, or there's going to be a rain uh, coming and you have an extensive humidity, humidity and moisture could uh, sabotage your whole beautiful installation. And I, you know, you gotta, we got to get this job done. It's only a, it's only, you know, a light sprinkle. Well, remember what I told you earlier, JW saying <laughs> there's never enough time to do the job right, but always enough time to do it over. Don't be one of those guys. So I would, I would wait. And if you do uh, get in a pickle and there's moisture and the rain comes while you're doing it, you're going to have to let it dry out. You're going to have to get some backpack blowers and you're going to have to dry the surface because yeah. dry sand will drop to the base and give you ballast. Wet sand won't. Yeah. And a lot of times all, all it requires is some com communication with the, uh, with the client, right? If they understand that, you know, that, that installation may be um, in, in jeopardy if we commence or uh, continue with the installation in the wrong way, I'm sure they'll understand if you if you need to come back. Yeah, I've had guys cover the putting greens with uh, visqueen plastic, you know, but you gotta understand visqueen and plastic in areas like Texas will also creates humidity. So you pull it off and now you, you still have moisture there. So it's better to cover for rain, but when you pull that plastic up, you still have to blow that, that moisture from that visqueen underneath it. Sure, know your climate. Yeah. Well, I know um, kind of moving on to cutting one of your favorite topics. Um, can def you define in your term cutting and, and what's happening in these images? Well, if we go back to when we were doing the infill placement, you're crossing and overlapping when you're putting your infill in. So what happens is if you're doing that, the overlapped areas, by the time you get to the top, if you think that the, the infill is complete, then when you roll it, the roller is going to go ahead and push down that top fiber and you're going to have a little lip everywhere you overlapped on your infill. So what happens is I recommend, I, I actually, uh, um, I developed a process called cutting uh, decades ago where we got to, we slowly infilled the putting green. And then when we got to the top, we overfilled it and we actually cut it. And it doesn't mean with a scissor. If you see the pictures here, what it does is it actually will cut the fibers to where they're level. So by the time you power broom or, or if you have a small putting green in a backyard and you have an asphalt broom, you, you see a picture there that uh, there, uh, I think there's one up there maybe. And what happens, you want the sand level before rolling. So if you have any overlapped areas or the infill is not level being placed in level, or if you're placing it by hand, you're not gonna have that level surface because Remember with that big football player that's going to stay out there and walk on it? What's going to happen is all these top fibers are going to bend over on top of that sand level. And if your sand level is not cut level, then what's going to happen is you're going to have irregular ball play and the ball is going to be bouncing. Yeah, and a kind of a continuation of this, these next images will probably help explain that even further. But I got to admit, when I first saw these, I was a little confused. So tell us what's going on here in the comparison well, to your, your, your drawing. This, this is for an all infill professional putting green. Um, and it definitely needs to be cut. Um, the sand needs to be cut level. Um, and not only that, um, there's a way that you must put this infill in uh, very carefully. Because if you look at the, the pictures here, there's a frayed rope. Well, what happens is, you'll want to be able to place the infill very carefully and not over fibrillate the top fibers. And I recommend, um, and I, it's been very successful at putting uh, 10, to, 10 to 15 passes in one up and back without even putting a broom on it. A uh, majority of the infill will drop below before you start to uh, fray, like that rope, the top heads of the fiber. 
the the more you fray that top fiber, the less the infill is going to drop to the base and uh, and give you a good stable um, uh, surface so that you could start uh, rolling and and it actually be a, a level surface before, uh, below the fibers. So I recommend not overfibrillating too much at the beginning because if you overfray the fibers, you you're going to prevent getting all the infill in. So be able to back off the, the power broom, um, be patient, get that at the beginning. Get, at the beginning, yeah. Yeah. Don't don't ever on an all infill go out and pre power broom it. Um, that's that's you know, it's going to sabotage your your stent meter speeds. Period. Are you um, are you looking for a maybe a specific blade reveal? So like this image here on the right, what um, on a sand filled style green? What blade reveal do you like to see before you start rolling it? Well, anywhere from a quarter to a half an inch. Um, but if you look at that picture right there, when you cut like those pictures before, when you use the power broom as a machine, just like this, when you're building a road and, and the, when they build the road, they're actually cutting the grade down for the road. Well, they're cutting a certain level. Well, that's what you need to do. You need to get this cut at a certain level. And what's happened is when you get it cut toward uh, a quarter to a half an inch, it's going to be more advantageous for you to roll and create memory loss for the fiber to roll over for you to have a smooth surface. Yeah. So I would say you know, and, uh, keep, keep, your, keep, your, keep the splines of the all infill vertical as much as you can, like that picture to the left, the rope with a, with a you know, keep it vertical as much as you can, you know? And then at the very end, when you, when you get to the infill to the top, overfill it, then you start doing the cutting process. Yeah, which segues us right into rolling. Um, well, the cutting process, Brad, that, let's go back. Brad, let's go yep. back to the infill process where that diagram with the, uh, you know, the alarm clock uh, analogy that I said. One more, one more, one more, right there. So when you're going to be doing any type of uh, brooming, no, the one before that, Brad? Yeah, right there. Um, you'll definitely want to follow um, the patterns and, and cut it, uh, power broom it, because remember, you're trying to, get all those overlapping and everything cut to a certain level before below the fiber so that when you do roll it, then the ball is actually playing on what? The sand. And uh, because the fibers are rolled over on that level cut sand base that you just provided. Yeah. I think we have one more um, time for one more question here. Um, so do we need to worry about this on texturized greens? Of what? Cutting? Uh, cutting on texturized greens. Oh, oh yes. If you look back to the flip, the footprint where the footprint is settled into the surface. Now you can't just go and like the, keep on going right there. Now see that picture in the middle. Now I want you to go a couple slides forward, and you'll see there's a nylon. Keep on going. Right. One more. One more. Right there. The picture. The second one to the right. It's a nylon that's overfilled right there above to the one above, that one right there. It's a nylon overfilled and what he's doing is he's cutting the sand level in each way prior to putting a roller on it. So by the time it gets cut in all those fashions, then the actual, like I said before, your final cut is below the fibers, which will put you in a great position for you to start rolling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that. I, I just wanted to make a make a quick distinction on the two different styles. But um, okay, rolling. Um, is there a method to the madness here when it comes to rolling? And, and is the method dictated at all by the type of roller equipment that you actually or need to use for the project? Yeah, that's um, a good I've got question. one more kind of follow up to that, but I'll let you answer that first. A good question. Um, I would say depending on the size of the project, um, you know, that's that I would get the side of a roller for it. Uh, water rollers work great for backyards, um, but you know, you get these areas that are cold climates that the water roller is not heavy enough and it takes a couple days to really get you a number 11 on the stent meter on it. Um, and also deadline, you know, if you have a deadline on a project that uh, needs the, the fibers to be uh, completely um, rolled, then I would bring a bigger machine out there with uh, more weight to it. And I definitely roll each way the same same way, you know. So, and also, and also, hey, you have to have this. 
Every crew has to have this. When you get done rolling, you're going to see areas that might need to be cut again. They might need to be rolled a little bit more. So you need to make sure that your crew has this so that they could actually, you know, test out what they did because otherwise you'll be definitely getting callbacks. So if you install putting greens and you don't have a, a club and some balls in your shock, um, make that the first thing you do. But uh, secondly, how do you know when enough rolling is enough before taking off and leaving that job site and considering it done? Well, if you look to the picture way up to the left, uh, you'll see that, and the one down below in the middle, you'll see that the, the fibers are starting to bend over. And, you know, we all know that whenever there's turf that's shiny, whether it be uh, all infill or, or be landscape, that means the UV sunlight shining on and it's, it's leaning. It's not actually vertical. Uh, when synthetic turf is vertical, it'll, it'll show a more da uh, darker uh, sheen. Um, so I recommend rolling until the fibers are completely uh, flattened and, um, and you'll start noticing that like the, the pictures that you have here, especially the one down the middle. And uh, they should be, uh, most of the fibers should be flattened and, and bent over in a 90 degree angle encapsulating the sand. And that'll yeah. give you definitely 11, 12 on the step meter. Yeah, I like that, um, you know, just looking kind of for those um, inconsistencies in the color, right? Mm -hmm. The dark versus yeah. the maybe shinier. Um, Plus you gotta get down your knees and, and, and make sure that you've got that 90 degree, you know, bend. And, right. um, and you know, if you have any type of bumps or anything, you're, you're on an all infill, um, even even on a even on a, a nylon texture or a PP, um, you still could go back out there and and make make it roll better by by adjusting the infill and the uh, uh, and the cutting. Um, because remember, you've already did the base perfectly. So if your base is no good, then you're going to have irregular ball roll. I think this too is an opportunity to to really get the uh, client or the homeowner involved and. And setting proper expectations with them going forward too. So you may leave the site at maybe a 10 on the step, but maybe eventually they want to get it to a 12. And so leaving them with a, a, a lawn roller as a part of the project or, you know, whatever, recommending that they purchase one, there's there's some effort that they need to put into the to the Yeah, definitely, well definitely. Time. Especially an all infill professional one. You know, they're definitely going to have to possibly – depending on their region, if they get snow, they might have to uh, top dress, you know, every season, uh, depending on what type of green. Yeah. All right, let's move on. I want to make sure we have some time for questions. So um, one last thing, um, what would you see as the most commonly avoidable maintenance hazards on putting greens, or maybe a different way of phrasing it? What is easily avoidable, uh, but too often forgotten or too often overlooked? I mean, we're looking at a lot of different maintenance related items here, but maybe one or two takeaways? Well, number one, I would say keep the excessive water at bay. Just um, that picture that you have there. You know, I know a lot of people are throwing in putting greens in the middle of grass areas. You're gonna be getting phone calls of the hard water deposits uh, with, within weeks. So you must have that and let the, the client know that if you're gonna be putting a putting green where any water is going to be, number one, it's going to it's going to totally take your play of the ball out. Uh, your step meter speeds are going to uh, go down, and um, you're going to have an ugly putting green like that. So keep the water bay, uh, keep the surface clean and clear of foliage. Um, pine needles, uh, you know, they're they're not easy to blow off, and but what happens is when you get a lot of walking on them, they crunch and they go down in the fiber, especially. Um, uh, uh, the nylons, uh, they'll, they'll, and it's, it's, it'll affect your centimeter speed. And then you look like you got some moss there too, fungus and moss. Um, there's some great products on the market today. Um, if you need to know what they are, you could reach out to me later and I can tell you the ones that will combat hard water deposits, uh, fungus and mold, and all types of uh, bacteria that does sabotage your, your putting greens. Yeah, look out for those tree droppings too. Yeah, yep. whether it's saps or different types of berries, man, can really wreak havoc on and even stain uh, putting greens. So uh, yep. spatial and, design, right? Always and, and, keep, and keep the dogs off it. You know, mm -hmm. I, I understand that some people will have their dogs and they think that, you know, a dog going to the bathroom on it is no big deal. Um, but it depends how much better you want to get in golf. <laughs> yeah. Or spend time cleaning up uh, after your yeah. dogs on your putting green. 
Um, okay, JW, that was awesome. Um, again, we can talk for, for hours about this, but I wanted to make sure that we get some information up here um, for those on the call that have some follow-up questions. Um, but speaking of questions, let, let's get to a few of those. Um, I know we had at least a couple of come, few, uh, come through. Um, the first being, uh, can you go deeper into what shot absorption is and why it's important? Well, if you're looking to hold a shot, which I think that's uh, they're looking for, um, you'll have to get with your manufacturer and find out what product that they are, uh, are, are selling uh, for you to and actually have a shot that'll uh, hold a shot from 20, 30 yards away, depending on how far. Um, I know there's probably callers on here that actually put a, uh, a pad below. Um, if that works with your system that you're buying now, then um, you know, don't change it. Um, the only thing is that I say is make sure your pad has the same warranty as your putting green, because if your underneath pad, you know, starts to fail before your putting green, you're going to be ended up ripping it out and putting a new pad or no pad whatsoever. So um, uh, I would definitely get with your manufacturer, the, the all infill. Um, it is, I've actually shot uh, 55, 85 yards away without even a shock pad on it. And the all infill one inch high um, actually will hold a shot. I have videos that's been up where it just it just holds a shot. Now you gotta understand if you're gonna be having uh, uh, an area just for chipping and you're gonna have uh, a nylon PP or a, a nylon or a PP texturized or an all infill, if you're using it just for chipping, you're gonna have to maintain that infill level uh, more often because by the time you get done chipping, your stint meter speeds are gonna be off the hook. You're gonna have ball bounce everywhere because you have to you know, once they hit, sometimes they will splash and, uh, and move the sand out. Yeah, and, and speaking of sand and, and ballast layers, so always striking a good balance too between the, um, uh, the angularity or the roundness of the, the infill that you're using too. You want to, you know, create a nice firm surface, but it can't lock up too much over time. It's just going to be like a, you know, a concrete surface. So when it comes to shot absorption, your infill materials, uh, the roundness of those inf infill materials can play a role in that too. They got to be Especially clean. They got to be clean. Because once, once your infill has conglomerates and, not the, and you put something in that's dirty, then they're going to bond together and that's going to make the ball bounce. Yeah, I'll put Okay, um, second one, how do you recommend getting good results when rolling in cooler temperatures for a slip film green? Well, we have tricks for that. Um, you can reach out to me later, but um, you know, I've seen guys spend four days on a putting green trying to get those suckers to bend over and lose memory because it's so cold. Um, there's been, uh, I have a trick where we, we have a water roller that we fill with concrete and, and then we get a plumber's torch and heat it up. We can talk about that later and it, you know, you need heat and weight. Um, so if you're doing a putting green in a, a cold region, uh, the more weight you have, uh, the more they're gonna, uh, they're gonna bend over quicker and uh, lose their memory and flatten. Um, but uh, in the colder regions, you might need a little bit of warmth. So. Um, yeah, can you use a big, kind of those big and medium size industrial heaters? Well, I, I, I really hate to talk about heat and any type of heater or any type of torch around a putting green unless I talk to them personally because you know, the, the worst thing you could do is have any type of heat or torch or fire around uh, any type of putting green to cause the fibers to curl. But uh, yeah, I teach a lot of people in the winter, I mean, in the cold uh, uh, regions, uh, how to actually finalize their slip films uh, and not have to be there for four days. So give me a call um, um, when this is over and I'll, I'll uh, send you some pictures of some of uh, things that I've created. Awesome. Um, okay, at least one more here. Um, this gentleman has a full sanded green um, that for some reason puts well in one direction, but not back in the opposite direction. How best can I remedy this? Um, he could probably go and uh, re, uh, he's gonna have to go back and, and actually fibrillate that and recut it. Um, because maybe he's got, maybe he cut one way. So he's got all the fibers going one way and he's got them all rolled one way and that's going to affect it. That's why it's very important to keep on going in those patterns on everything infill wise, cutting wise, because what you're doing is you're causing all the fibers to just go each way. So when you roll them over, they're not just all going this way. They're going all which ways and flattening. So the ball will play right. So I would say go back out there and, and recut in those directions so that, and then re-roll. I know that might be a pain in the butt, but 
that's the only way it's going to help that. Yeah. Um, well, good answers. I, um, I think that's all the questions that I see. Um, we'll hang on here for just a couple minutes in case anybody, um, something else comes to mind. But I know we added a couple additional slides in case we had time to get to them. But um, JW, out of any of these, is there any, um, any that you want to just kind of pause on for a second? Well, the water. Sure. Go, back, go back to the water one because if you're going to be doing putting greens, flooding, um, flooding is so, this, there's a project here to where they put a putting green, elevated it up in the air, uh, 12 inches higher than the finished floor of the, found, of the foundation. And not only did the roof water um, come off the roof, the square footage, but um, it also came off the scuppers and all the water went right into the house. So you've got to be careful of where you're going to be putting your putting green if you're going to elevate it too high. Um, because what's going to happen is the, if you elevate it too high, the exterior synthetic turf that you're going to be putting to it, that's going to be a whole yard. Um, if the below soil doesn't have good permeation and it's too sloped far, it's going to be a start a slide. So just respect the roof, uh, whoever's going to be estimating the project and, and there's scuppers and water coming off the roof. You definitely want the putting green uh, to be you respect that that water is going to be damaging uh, the, the play of the ball. And this was just a, a drain pipe added after the fact, is that right? Well, no, it, you know, once they put the putting green in, the roof and all the drainage around there, just it, it just uh, all went into the house. So it's, it's yeah. disrespect all, even in synthetic turf, you know, you want to respect all the, the drainage from everybody comes in there and wants to estimate the project, but they're not looking above. I was out at the Ritz-Carlton, we were doing, I was consulting uh, 30,000 square feet, uh, Dana Point in California. And a big storm was coming in and they were doing the compacted dirt work. Well, the, the building is 20,000 square foot alone and it's all sloped towards where we're doing the install. So not only did we get the storm water, but we got the roof water too that no one really understood and everything had to be pulled out and redone and compacted. Nasty. Yeah, you definitely want to avoid those situations, you know, and, and I think when it comes to water irrigation, we had, um, we had a slide in here at one point, oh. just, you know, taking, really kind of understand the, the network of irrigation that you're dealing with, um, best practice, maybe cap it at the valve so you don't have any, you know, lines full of water running, running under the putting green that could rupture at any given point and have a, a massive repair job on your hands. Um, but JW, we've got just a couple minutes. We'll probably wrap up a little bit early. I haven't seen any other questions come through. Um, thank you so much for being here, being willing to take a few questions. Um, anything else before um, kind of signing off? No, just, um, you know, there's, there's so many talented installers out there and I appreciate um, every one of you that are, um, you know, making the industry proud and wanting to do better. And, um, and that means a lot. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better. Thanks, everybody, for joining today. Um, reach out to, to either JW or myself if we can help you out with any other follow-up questions, um, and we look forward to it. Thanks, all. Thank you, Thank you Brad.